Welcome back to It Starts Now, the happy hour of finance and business. My name is Stanley. Uh, today's guest is a serial entrepreneur, a chef, a writer, author, a, uh, a speaker, a food security advocate. He's also the founder and CEO of Reggae Chef, and he's also archived in the National Library of Jamaica. Please welcome Peter Ivory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, we're glad to have you. I know you briefly from uh, passing and going, but every time we had an interaction, it was always great. It was always positive. When Ocasio set it up for us to have a sit down and really have a discussion, I really wanted to speak to you regardless because of the person you are, you always keep that energy. But then when I started to do the research and I was like, man, this guy's incredible. And I like the things that you're doing. And we really appreciate you being on this show. No, no, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, man. I think the, the energy is mutual, right? Um, I didn't hesitate because um, it was always a pleasant conversation and I wanted to fully um, embrace what you guys were doing. Thank you so much, man. Hey, before we begin, I just want you to get comfortable. First, I want to know what you're drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think, so, so it's no secret, I'm Jamaican. And so my Jamaican Ray and Nevio rum is never too far away. So I'm drinking Ray and Nevio rum with orange juice. Man, that Ray and Nevio strong, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 for real. Now, let's, let's dive in. Um, I, I heard one of your conversations when you were talking about insecurities when it comes to food. Mm -hmm. uh, can you explain more about that? Like, what is it, the concept behind it? Um, what is food insecurity? Yes. All right. Food insecurity is, um, for me, one of the more, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the more serious inflictions that, that, that surround food issues because food insecurity does not have a face, right? Most mm -hmm. people are familiar with what hunger looks like or what starvation looks like, All right. but anybody can be food insecure and it's just as serious. And I think that's why I've made that my fight because I've had um, issues with food insecurity and I know people who are food insecure and you wouldn't be able to tell, right? These are people who are well-dressed, people who have jobs. They're your neighbors. They are your friends. You just don't know it. But so if you think about what food insecurity is, it's the inability to, to sufficiently feed yourself. And, and what sufficiently mean, means in this case is lack of enough nutrition, uh, lack of enough food, right? Um, access to food, right? Um, living in a food desert, for example. And so if you think about it in that way, so many of our uh, people who live in urban areas, um, like certain parts of the Bronx or Brooklyn, who don't have a farmer's market, right, inside their neighborhood are food insecure because they will be lacking certain nutrients and certain vitamins and certain things that they need. Sure. And so in a nutshell, food insecurity is just lack of sufficient access to food, nutritious food, mm -hmm. not being able to afford food or not being able to afford enough food to feed an entire family. Yeah. I, I, I like what you said earlier when you said that there's a lack of farmer's market in uh, um, certain neighborhoods. Yes. And if you go in the city, there's a farmer's market that stay crowded and the type of people you see there, you could tell that um, they really value what they put inside their system. Absolutely. And you could see the difference between going into like a commercial uh, supermarket and you, you could tell the difference what they're providing from what they're not providing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's part of the reason why I've taken up the fight uh, for food insecurity for everybody. So my fight is global. Okay. However, there is definitely a disparity between, uh, um, between demographics, between um, even races, so to speak right? Um, a lot of people who look like me and you, Stanley, right. don't have sufficient access to the healthy food that we need, right? And so when you go to certain neighborhoods and you see that you're wondering what, what is happening here, right? right? Why aren't these foods making into our neighborhoods? Right. Why, why isn't the freshest vegetables and fruits coming in, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why my fight is important because I've realized that it's an issue that while it's a global issue, it is affecting uh, black and brown people at uh, an alarming rate more than any other people. That, that's, I agree with you all the way. 
uh, eat, not not just the fresh produce. Sometimes, like the, the for those that eat meat, of uh, even that sometimes you can see the difference in coloration in the meat and uh, the fish not smelling properly. Like there's a lot of things that you 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 find yourself when I go in a certain supermarkets. I'm like, yes. no, I can't be here because you can tell when you know the difference, right? Oh, of course, you know the difference because awareness is key. And I'm glad you brought that up because. Um, I tell people this all the time. You see, if, if you're from the Caribbean or you're from down south, we're used to eating meat. We cook the sh- crap out of meat when we, when we eat it. Mm-hmm. We season it all the way down to the bone and we boil it, stew it, fry it, cook it all the way down to the bone, right? Mm-hmm. Um, other cultures, they don't cook or eat meat that way, right? They have other dishes that require the meat sometimes to be raw. Right. Mm-hmm. And sure. so you realize yeah. that the meat that make it into neighborhoods with that is predominantly African-American and Caribbean, that's the meat of lesser quality because they know that the way we cook our meat, we won't be able to tell the difference. Make sense. Mm-hmm. And so they have to bring the better quality meat to other neighborhoods because they eat their meat medium, you know, rare. Uh, they have dishes, carpaccio, like they have these other dishes that rely on the consistent quality of meat, right? And so there's, they've invested money to mm-hmm. know what to pump in our communities. There's no doubt about that, right? Yeah, and yeah. so we would even realize, most of us don't even realize when we have lesser quality meat because of the way we cook and the way we eat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is true. And, and it's, it's similar to like, um, it's similar, at a, I'm gonna give you a prime example. We went to uh, uh, this, clothing company and we went to Zara's in a certain in area they didn't have the same line that they had in the city of course. Right? completely different line so I, I get the comparison what you're saying because when you go into certain areas that you won't have the the the, the high end or the, the the quality stuff listen how long right. have you been doing this for uh, food insecurity, entrepreneurship, which... Um, total. We're going to get into entrepreneurship, but as far <laughs> as um, food insecurity, because you also are a chef. Yes. Yes. Um, so my social responsibility, Stanley, I've always been high, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's just the way I do business. I, I, I do business and ensure that some way, somehow, the community is benefiting from the business that I'm doing. Um, and so when I became a chef about, I would say about seven years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And something strange happened to me in culinary school, Stanley. So I went to culinary school. I had already started the reggae chefs. The reggae chefs was doing well. Okay. And we, I was hiring chefs to be a part of the team, but I wasn't a chef. Right. So, you know, people start to say, start to run jokes with me, start to rib me and say, hey, how can you be telling us what to do, right? We know you can cook, but you need to go get the, the thing, right? Yeah, the certifications. Exactly. So I went mm-hmm. to school and I immediately realized that I was, I was very different from my peers, right? Um, I saw things differently. I experienced my lessons and what they were teaching me very differently. And one day I was in class and one of my professors you know, he was very excited to have the new class and he was telling us that the culinary field is exploding and it's going to be a great time to be a chef. Um, about a week later, I went to an event at the United Nations and that is where I learned for the very first time that hunger is on the rise. There is a, a crisis in the world. People are hungry and people are starving. And these two things I learned almost at the same time just did not make sense to me. Yeah, the My awakening. Chef, yeah, my teacher is saying that the culinary field is, is exploding, which means that more people are cooking, right? Mm-hmm, right. And on the other hand, I'm learning that there is a starvation issue, which means there are more people hungry. And so these two things just didn't make sense. I knew right then and there that the type of chef I was going to be was going to be someone who didn't make a meal for $5,000, but I was going to make a meal for people who really wanted to eat. Yeah. Right? And right. so that separated me from my peers because these are people who dreamt of becoming chefs. They wanted to work in the fanciest restaurants in Manhattan to to be highlighted as an individual for their efforts. And I immediately started to recognize 
um, how peeling a carrot a different type of way could help people who are hungry, how peeling a potato a particular type of way, the properties of the potato, what exactly I could use this for that's going to help a group of people in East Africa, for example. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I went to culinary school. And that was when it really hit me that this is something I wanted to do. And I just started from there and I started Mission Food Possible about two years later. And um, Mission Food Possible is now recognized as possibly one of the answers to the world hunger crisis. Oh, that's big. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Because uh, you're making an impact. And on a global scale, you're really making an impact. Yes. And I think that, that has to be amplified a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, when did you tap? Now, you told me you tapped into it when you was in culinary school. But when did you tap into uh, the spirit of entrepreneurship that, to know when is the right time to jump into something? Right. Um, great question. But I've, I've known that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I did, at the time, I did not know that that's what it's called. Mm. I knew exactly what I wanted to be since I was five or six years old. Son. Um, I'm on record publicly. So my life story was aired in the Caribbean a, a, a few years ago. And I shared this story that my grandfather would... Um, where my grandmother lived, there was a huge open lot that a church convention would like, be kept every year, right? Mm -hmm. My grandfather figured out that to make extra money, he could just sell refreshments to the church people who was next door, right? right? So he, he would cut this hole into the zinc fence and he would put like a wooden shelf there and he would sell bun and cheese and bread and all these things. And what my grandfather did was, and this is interesting because at that time, I didn't even know if bottled water existed. But my <laughs> grandfather would catch water in a plastic bag. Mm -hmm. He would freeze them in the freezer and he would put them in an empty paint can and he would lift me at five or six across the fence and have me walk around and sell these, bo like, like these bags of water right. or bags of ice, right? Mm -hmm. And I fell in love. I fell in you, love. You, you fell in love because of the hustle or you I, fell in love was because of that connection you had with your grandfather? I fell in love because I knew how poor we were and I knew the value of money. Mm. I knew that money was something that everybody around me did not have enough of. And so for me to be walking around, no shirt, right. uh, 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 ripped up shorts, barefoot, right. and all I had to do was give someone this thing and they give me back money, I fell in love with that. And That's that powerful. is something that stayed with me for the rest of my life. Um, and so I knew exactly that I wanted to live my life as I progressed into age nine and age 10 and age 11 and age 12. And I'm starting businesses right throughout my, my teenage years, right? I knew that I was in love with the process of finding something of value and then convincing you, Stanley, that it's valuable to your life and have you exchange money with me for that thing. So I would say five or six years old, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. And that's exactly what I did. I spent, um, I created maybe six, seven businesses in high school, right? Mm -hmm. I was known for that. I was the kid that was known for hustling and for creating stuff. So yeah, I knew very early. Now, all those, all those ventures that you had growing up, uh, I'm pretty sure they, they helped you along the way to really uh, create what you have going on right now. So what are some of the learning lessons that you learned from that point to now? Um, so, so let me, let me put this out there, right? So mm -hmm. I, I, I never graduated from a tertiary institution with any degree in business. And so every single thing I've learned is through trial and error and through failure. Right. Right. And so, to earn the title of chief executive, right? Right. I learned what it means to be a chief executive by very early on having my friends as my first team around me. And okay. so those early lessons in high school where I had to get my friends together and say, hey, we're not, we're not going to spend our lunch money for the next month. This is how we're going to do it. We're going to save this, do this. We're going to bring lunch. You bring the fork, you bring the knife. I bring the bread, you bring this, right? That taught me the importance of teamwork from early. And so that's your very first answer to the question. Mm -hmm. 
one of the lessons that I learned was that I can't do it by myself. And I took that into adulthood. Yeah. Teamwork is very important, yeah. right? It's important to find that early. Mm-hmm. Well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Abs- absolutely. And I think that's one lesson from entrepreneurship is to fail early. Mm-hmm. Fail fast, fail early, right? Right. Um, if you're failing fast, Stanley, you're ahead of the game. I worry when I'm not failing. Yeah. Yeah. That's my thing. If, if is there's no progress. When, there's no progress. I'm not learning, right? Right. The guy who's behind me who's failing, best believe that he's learning how not to do something quicker than you. Yeah. And so imagine if I'm saying that I'm learning the importance mm-hmm. of failure when I was 10, 11, and 12. Mm-hmm. Right? And so I was learning. Um, oh, oh, oh. Sorry, I don't want to stray from the original question. What was the question that you asked me? No, it was some of the lessons that you learned. Oh, yeah, yeah. So teamwork. Um, the importance of failure. Yeah. I learned that very early on. Um, I was disappointed a lot. Um, but looking back now, I realized that every single thing was my classroom to, to entrepreneurship. It's everything that it wouldn't have taught me in schools, right? I learned sales. I learned how to pitch. I learned how to sell my ideas. I learned how to discuss my ideas within the confines of a group, right? right? And so I learned those things early sitting under a manga tree in Jamaica. So everything was like, a, to your point, a classroom. Like you, of course. Man, that's, I like that. Of course. I think that's and probably like the first time I, I heard something phrased that way. That like, mm-hmm. yeah, I like that a lot. Man, let, let's, I want to keep going, but I know there's other things I want to touch on as well. Was that one of the reasons why it, it catapults you to become a, a speaker? Um. Being a speaker is com- was not in the plans, Stanley. <laughs> yeah, because I read somewhere. Yeah. yeah, I read somewhere you said um, you used to stutter when you were younger, and now you're a speaker. Absolutely, and so there okay. are a few things about my personality that would have prevented me from even having that as a plan. That was that is something that um, really kind of caught me by surprise, and. I begin every one of my speeches with one phrase, with one sentence. I say, um, listen up, because I'm only here because I have something to say. And that's because I only speak when I have something to say, right? Um, I was born with a very bad stutter. And so that affected my confidence. There was no way I would have wanted to, 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 to be a speaker. And I could even say my name properly, right? Mm-hmm. That's one. Two, I grew up in the ghetto in Jamaica, you know? You are taught to keep your mouth shut, right? Real men don't, you know what I mean? Chatter, yeah. Right. And so if you think about to use the title of speaker or to say you are speaker, it goes against how I was raised and what my capabilities were, right? Mm -hmm. Um, It just so happened that I started to do so much in entrepreneurship that I started to get invited to speak about it to speak about what I got right and what I got wrong. When it came to young people, I really wanted and cared about the responsibility to talk to young people, right? right. And so that's where speaking started and I just kept going with it and the invites kept coming in. Um, to this day, I don't advertise myself as a speaker. I just recently changed my, my, um, my social media pages to include speaker in it right? Mm -hmm. But you won't find a speaker website or anything like that because um, I believe my journey as an entrepreneur is, as an entrepreneur is still going, right? Uh, True. But that never stops though. No, no, no. It never stops. And speaking, Mm. speaking in itself is, is a business. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But in many ways, that's not the type of business that fascinates me. As I said, I love creating a product, right? Right. Creating a product and convincing you that this product and speaking, speaking is, is the same way, but I enjoy how it happens to me, which is me building up knowledge and persons realizing that this knowledge is valuable. Mm -hmm. We would like to hear, hear you speak that knowledge. Right. 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 So yeah, that's, that's how speaking happened. Um, totally by accident, but I love it. Yeah. Uh, I I saw one of the speeches and 
Uh, you felt very comfortable up there for somebody that didn't think that was going to be the path, with that, which I thought was uh, uh, pretty great. Um, it says a lot of, about a person's char- character when they try to overcome their fears to go out there and present. And Absolutely. That's, that's always a positive thing, right? Um, let, let's touch on now you got speaker and then you go into charity. You got this charity thing going on. Mm-hmm. You want to explain that? So as I said before, my, my sense of social responsibility was always high. Mm-hmm. But it, it, upon going to culinary school and operating the reggae chefs, I started to hone in on what exactly I wanted to do to give back. And it had something to do with food. And I, and I knew that I had an idea that I did not see anywhere else in the world. Right? And so you know, there's a thing about res- social responsibilities that for me, once you stumble upon it, you can't forget it. Right. You literally have a responsibility to the world, to your environment, to go through with it. And so um, before it became a charity, it was an idea. It was, hmm, I think I know what has been missing from every other effort to stop world hunger before me. Right? Mm-hmm. And that, if you think about it, that's crazy. Because I'm just a poor kid from Jamaica. How dare me, you know, like say something like that. But right. I really started to look at it and I really feel, felt like <clears throat> there's been uh, like all these approaches and there's been a very obvious approach that, that was missing. And so what I did was I <clears throat> stayed up all night for weeks working on a formula that I felt could calculate which foods were important to any town, any city, any community, any region, any place in the world Mm -hmm. at any given time, right? And that's what we came up with. And we built our project around that and eventually we became a registered charity. Um, We, as chefs, we take this formula, we go into these communities, we identify what are the most valuable produce in these communities and then our team of chefs take these valuable foods and teach the community how to make creative, innovative dishes that they've never heard of sometimes, right. um, just to bolster and strengthen their food security. Mission Food Possible, our first mission, our first project was in 2017. So the organization was founded in 2016 and we executed our first mission in 2017. Yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. Now with reggae chefs. Yes, sir. All right. Um, now it's a group of people. Um, because you were yeah. saying you were touching base on it earlier when you said you were bringing people on board before you was a, a bona fide uh, chef. So is a conglomerate of different um, chefs. Yes, absolutely. So um, I'll tell you where we are now, and I'll work you back so you fully understand how it okay. is. So, right. so let me touch on my wine a little bit. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the reggae chefs um, is a group of chefs, right? Mm-hmm. We are now a franchise. Right. So now mm-hmm. we, we now exist um, on the East Coast in the USA mm-hmm. and in Jamaica. Mm-hmm. And um, the vision for the reggae chefs was um, it, 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 it came to me because I was in a very tough time. Right. Everything I was touching was failing. And once everything else failed, I had this idea. I don't know if we have time for me to tell you how Reggae no, Chefs go ahead. Go the ahead. idea came from. All right. So I, was, I used to live in Las Vegas. Go ahead. I went to Las Vegas um, when I was going through a very challenging time. And I happened to go to a reggae concert for the very, same, um, for the very first time. I've never been to a reggae con- like a concert before. Right? Through all your years? Throughout all my years. Because remember, I grew up very poor in Jamaica. Uh-huh. Right? We, we, we couldn't afford to go to like, the big concerts. We went to like, the street dances. Right right, right, right. So I never really see all the major stars and crowds and, and, and like white people, right? I never see right. white people in like thousands listening to reggae music. <laughs> right. And this is what I saw in, in Las Vegas. And I was like, oh, crap. Reggae is that big? Yeah. I had no idea reggae was that big. Like, really? Mm-hmm. Right? And I was walking around this stadium or this venue and I saw Jamaican food being sold. But more than half the people were not Jamaicans. And so I was just looking at it and I'm going, 
you're telling me that my culture is this big? Like thousands of people just wanting Jamaican food so much that they're willing to buy it from people who were not Jamaicans. Yeah. And they would listen to our music in the hot sun for hours. Yeah. And so this idea was in me, but I didn't know what it was. I ended up coming back to New York and fell on even harder times. And I sat one day and I said, the only thing I'm, I'm left with, Stanley, is the fact that I have this accent mm -hmm. and I can cook. What the heck can I do with this? <laughs> <laughs> right? I, mean, yeah, I have an accent right. and I can cook. Right. And, I, rem and I, real I remembered how valuable I thought the culture was when I saw thousands of people listening to the music. Yeah. And I started to research what other things were valuable about my culture. And as it turns out, I created a formula called, well, not a formula, I created something called the icons of culture, where I, I was able to pinpoint the value of everything that a tourist might go to Jamaica for, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And put a value on that. Right. And so I said, okay, I have this, but how do I deliver this? And the best way to get a group of people together is through food. Oh, that's, and so the that's idea true. was that's true. to create a personal chef service that did something that nobody else did, which was you could also, along with food, you could get chefs who knew their culture at like the back of their hand. Mm -hmm. You get chefs who could dance, who could teach you the latest dance moves. You get chefs who would teach you historical things about the culture. Right. You would get chefs who would teach you the language, right? And so we created this list of entertainment options that our clients could fuse their favorite dish with their favorite entertainment from the culture. Mm -hmm. And um, we started with, uh, obviously you need more than one chef to do all of that. And so we will travel in teams of two and you would have teams of regular chefs popping up in New York, in Maryland, in Florida, in North Carolina. Right. Right. And then, and, and we operated that way for a while until we started to give each place their own piece of the pie, so to speak, right? Start to allow chefs um, to invest in the business and get their own, um, um, like run their own operation. Wow. Make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And all that came from a thought. All that came from a thought, yes. See, the power of thinking. Yeah. yeah. And so the regular chefs really was the platform for everything I'm doing. Um, although I've created so many things in the past. It was the first thing that really gained media attention all across the globe. Um, and that's how and you guys got into a Forbes magazine in the Daily News? Um, the Daily News was the first major media publication in the USA to, to publish a story on the reggae chefs. Mm -hmm. The Forbes magazine story was about Peter Ivey. Oh. That came about, a, about two years ago, I think. Um, and it was about the culmination of my work and who I am and what I was doing globally. That's big. Yeah. Yeah. And did anything like, uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of things that you gained from that Forbes magazine, like a lot of recognition, uh, a lot of requests to have uh, for you to pre present yourself and present what you have going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the Forbes feature was big. Because if you look back at that headline, it said, um, hunger charity might have the answer to the world's hunger problem or global or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And when I saw the headline, I got an instant headache because I knew that Forbes is the biggest publication in the entire world. Right. And if they say that this thing might be the answer to anything at all. So it's holding you accountable. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it opened a few doors, but it also taught me lessons about myself that I'm still learning. Right. Um, in 2012, I predicted that I would have been in Forbes magazine in seven years. Right. So you spoke into existence. I told that to all my friends, anyone who would listen. Mm -hmm. So actually 2019, yeah, so it wasn't two years ago. I was featured in Forbes in 2019. 2012 to 2019 is seven years exactly. So in 2012, I'm on record saying that I'm going to be in Forbes magazine in seven years time, right? But my dream to be in Forbes started years earlier because yeah. remember, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, I've been yeah. following these guys, these big name guys 
for many years. So I knew what I wanted to be and where I wanted to be seen. Right. And so that has always been a dream and a goal of mine. So when I said it in 2012, people laughed. But every year as my name and as the work we were doing became bigger and bigger, those laughs didn't, didn't sound too loud anymore, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it became very clear that we were heading in the right direction. Right. But here's what the future taught me. Sometimes we get locked into pursuing success, right? Right. And a lot of my disappointments came because I was constantly pursuing it. When I allowed success to ensue, right? Right. So a lot of us pursue, we don't allow success to ensue, right? right? Then we're able to count our successes in smaller increments versus this big, gigantic trophy on the wall. Because when that trophy on the wall comes, you might be disappointed because it might not bring what you expect it to bring. Right. And I can right. tell you, every time I saw Forbes when I was a kid, it was always a billionaire or a multimillionaire, right? And so you think that if you're going to be featured in Forbes, then obviously you're going to be a billionaire. Well, I'm not a billionaire, Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> so you think, I attached my goals to those things when I was younger mm -hmm. because of inexperience, because I kept pursuing success. Right, right. These days, I allow success to ensue. I, I make my moves, I take my actions, and mm. whether I pass or fail, I count those things as successes now. Mm. I yeah. like that. It sounds to me that um, you took the focus off yourself and put your focus on a mission, a goal, and uh, something that's going to get accomplished. And what happens a lot of times when you take the focus off yourself, you're, you're no longer chasing that success. You're, you're out here trying to accomplish something. And when that focus, when that gear shift and, you, and that focus starts to in line with the stars, the magic starts to happen because now things start opening up because like you just said to your point, um, everything is, is gaining you there. So it's not a failure, it's still a success because it's getting you there. I couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. There, there, there is, it's one of those things where when um, you hear someone say it, you don't believe it because you, you can't see it right away how this can equate to success. Right. But the unwritten rules, the unwritten rules in the grind mm -hmm. is something that if you don't go through it, you can't talk about it. Uh. Now, how do you tell someone that when you stop thinking about yourself mm -hmm. is when you'll see success? You can't really tell, like they won't believe you. They won't believe it. Yeah. They won't right. So there it. are yeah. unwritten rules that are written in the grind mm -hmm. that you must go through because that Stanley is absolutely true. It is. When you start to think about others, when you start to think about people, people will actually lift you up under your shoulders mm -hmm. and take you to where you want to get. Yeah. To. Yeah. That's true. That is, <laughs> yeah, that is so true that I remembered when, um, I always been, um, I always try to put myself in a position to, to try to help others. But sometimes you think you're in that position to try to help others until you realize that you, the benefit is you, you still focus on the benefit of helping yourself. And the moment I took um, the focus off of myself and I remember going back, uh, I, I was leading the team, you, you know, um, I was leading the teams and I, the moment I took the focus off myself and said, I got to help everybody around me and I got to help everybody around me succeed and win. And that's the point where um, uh, things start to happen. But the magic thing about it is, to your point, uh, not only that people are going to put you on your shoulders to take you there, but you don't know how many people you influence along the way. Absolutely. Yeah, there's so many people that you impact and uh, there's some some people I impact and not realizing until a couple of years later and they reach out like, man, you made a difference in my life. And that's so important. So you're right. And and that, that's why it's important for you to keep going, because you don't you never know who's watching and who you're inspiring and who you're motivating, because Absolutely. everyone's watching. Right. It's not just the haters. It's the other person that's looking to see, like, just like how you saw your, your grandfather you know, develop this thing to put water in a, in a, in a bottle 
and encourage you to hop over a fence and start selling, that probably was the thing that inspired you without you knowing. And, Absolutely. And you so said, it's important. If he didn't do that, you don't know, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why it's important to keep going, keep motivating people, and continue to do what you're doing because you don't know who's watching. Mm-hmm. And and I, we definitely like what you're doing, man. It's, it's impressive, man. So what else you got going on right now? Before I say that, all right? Okay. Um, I have a habit of counting the, the, the times I use the word I in anything, right? Yeah. And so I, 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 it's, it's time for me to bring up that I, nothing that I've been able to do wouldn't have been possible without my team. Yeah. Wouldn't have been possible without mentors and wouldn't have been possible without people who have supported me through thick and through thin. Um, I make moves as, as a team lead, but there's definitely a team, yeah. right? And so everywhere I talk or give an interview, I ensure that people understand that I am not an entrepreneur that move um, solo, right? Um, I move with people who are smart, who are brilliant, who, who, who want to see us make changes and are committed um, to ensuring that whatever vision that I bring to the table is executed effectively. Um, this year, I added author to my name. Um, I'm, I'm the author of two books. Uh, the first book was written in, in, in March. It's That's called Coronavirus. Thing. Coronavirus, get out of here. Coronavirus, get out of here. Yeah. And I, I mean, the thought of writing a book. It's a kid's book, by the way, right? It's a kid's book, yeah. Go ahead, all right. Now, the thought of writing a book crossed my mind, but I thought maybe when I'm 70, when I'm 60, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll just look at all these crazy stories and I'll put them in something, right? Mm-hmm. But March happened, coronavirus is happening, and my son is out of school, and he's, we're having a conversation as to why he's out of school. And the conversation was, was helpful to me because I, I struggled with it. Because I didn't know what was happening. Right. And it was helpful to him. And I called up my, one of my best friends who's an artist. And I said, look, I think the conversation I just had with my son, with PJ, might be something that we can share with other people. That's literally where that came from. And I wrote the book. He illustrated the pictures. We published the book, right? Mm-hmm. And we didn't know that it was one of the first children's book. Think about it. It's March, right? One of the first books that came out um, um, during the pandemic time. During the pandemic. And yes. so the United Nations and UNICEF took the book mm. and publicized the book, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, the Caribbean media took it, did media, like gave it to their students, right? Stuff like that. Um, India, Switzerland, like the book just went all over the world and came right. out. Um, That's and big. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And the, su- and the success of that, um, we thought that maybe it was time, since, since we did something that we never knew we could do, it was mm-hmm. time to take food security to another level. Mm-hmm. And so just last week, we completed work on the second book, which is uh, going to be a collection called Food Security Tales or Food Security Tales, right? which is going to be a series of children's book geared towards educating them about food security. So the first book is done and it's actually getting, uh, it's getting great reviews Mm -hmm. and it's actually being reviewed right now to be used in a school system in a Caribbean country. Oh, congratulations, man. Thank you. Yeah. That's huge. That's two huge projects right there. Thank you. Two huge projects that we did not see coming. True. And we were able to do it uh, during the pandemic. Absolutely. Well, everybody else was, uh, not everybody, well, for the most part, most people were panicking. Most people were unsure what was going on. And mm-hmm. um, most people try to become lean and uh, slim down the operation. But you guys were thinking outside of the box and created something. So, yeah, that's, that's huge, man. Congratulations, bro. Exactly. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, the, the, newest, um, the newest company to the portfolio started this year as well. It's called P3 Culinary Kit. Mm -hmm. It's actually the world's first uh, culinary kit 
for social minded chefs. Um, and that's been going well. And that's a business that also takes the pandemic into consideration because if you're now getting your all of your supplies in one kit delivered to you, then you're avoiding long lines, you're avoiding crowds, right? Um, and so that's a business that has also benefited from the pandemic that is that uh, it is doing well. And that's kudos to the team for believing in that concept at the time when we presented the idea to have this done. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we we definitely like the the the, the path that the, you guys are going into, man. I think that's awesome. Uh, big shout outs, man, to you and your team, man. <laughs> okay, you. so what what do you have going on uh, for 2021? Um, every year, the team and I create a list um, for the next year. Okay. So so we create so we have a 21 for 21 list that we're working on right now and we've been doing this for many years mm -hmm. so let's say it's 2017 we make a 17 for 17 or 18 for 18 right and so every year around this time we're working on um our 21 goals for 20 uh, for 2021 mm -hmm. um p3 culinary kit we would like that business to be the world's leading culinary supplies company. Yeah. Right? That's our goal for 2021. Um, we want to produce more food security tales. So we want to dive deeper into the books. Right? Okay. The biggest thing, um, the most exciting thing for 2021 is I'm looking to launch, I'm going to launch the, the seven day S3 summit, Stanley. And uh, I created the S3 concept, the spot, season, sustain concept. Mm -hmm. So, to um, highlight the importance of entrepreneurship and to raise awareness around entrepreneurship for, um, for young people, right? People live in impoverished, people live in impoverished communities. Um, and so it's been getting positive reviews. We've, we've, we've shared the S3 concept in West Africa. We've shared it in the Caribbean. We've shared it in Central America. And so we're going to have a seven day S3 summit where we're going to have people come in and talk about how they spot opportunities, how they seize opportunities and how they sustain opportunities. Mm. Yeah. So that's something yeah. I'm looking forward to. I like that. So we, before we go, if somebody, and, and I like to ask this question because everyone has something uh, unique, uh, which is a uh, good feedback for everyone. If you uh, were to give a suggestion to somebody that's trying to come up on the entrepreneurship, like, cause there's two, two parts to my question. One is what advice would you give somebody else? And the other thing, what advice you would have give to yourself growing up? I have a habit of answering that question right off the bat, right? What advice <laughs> would you give to entrepreneurs? Right. My usual answer is none, mm -hmm. none. And there's Why an answer. Um, one of the most important traits and characteristics an entrepreneur needs to have is grit, determination, and persistence, mm -hmm. right? And so one of the, my mentors did it to me. And so that's why I think I have the habit is I have no advice for you, right? If you need advice, you're going to have to dig it, dig for it. You're going mm -hmm. to have to uh, show me that you deserve the knowledge I've acquired over the years, mm -hmm right? Mm -hmm. You're going to have to demonstrate the very first quality of entrepreneurship, which is determination. Do you want the knowledge that I have? Show up tomorrow at 4 a.m. Right. I'll tell you. Right. So my, my mentors did that to me. But for the sake of conversation, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the best advice to entrepreneurs is be insightful. Right? I'll break that down. Be insightful. And I have two parts to my answer. And I want, like, don't forget the other part. I know you're asking yeah. the second part. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, entrepreneurship, I believe, is about solving problems. Correct. It's about changing your environment, changing the outcome of your life, and changing the outcome of somebody else's life. You can't do that if you're not listening. You can't do that if you're not insightful. You can't do that if you're not connected to your environment, to the people around you, to the world, 
or to anything else. A lot of us are disconnected. When we're disconnected, it causes us to follow a lot. We jump on ideas that already exist. We jump on other people's ideas. We steal other people's ideas. Or we're chasing uh, ideas that are our own, but we can't see that it's a dead end road because mm -hmm. we're locked into the idea. When you are listening to your environment, when you're listening to the pulse of the people, when you're listening to the issues that you have personally, and you come up with solutions to issues, therein lies ideas for businesses. Ideas for businesses, original ideas for businesses are in the solutions mm -hmm. to problems. And so that's my first, that's my advice, right? Right. Um, I forgot my other point, but what was the next, what was your second, second piece? What advice would you give yourself growing up? Like what were some of the things you could have avoided or just basic advice? The advice I would give myself is in times of doubt, keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Keep doing it. Cause I've, I've doubted myself many times. I've doubted whether or not I could be a globally recognized entrepreneur. I was like, who do you think you are? Right. You know, who do you think you are? Are you crazy? In those times where I've wasted weeks sulking, thinking I'm never, ever going to make it, or I'm just never going to know what it feels like to, 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 to appear in a newspaper in a village in Kenya, right? Yeah. I, I would tell myself, this is all part of the process, man. So that's the advice that we don't know that it's a part of the process, but it's all of it. All of it is a part of the story. It's happening for a reason. You just have to go through it. It's happening for a purpose. Your time is coming.